Host everyone, I hope everyone is well. Wow, welcome to 2020 slash wow, what a massive couple of months it's been around the world. But uh, we are so fortunate to have this uh, very special guest, uh, Mr. Xi'an Cameron Quinn from the Gold Coast in Australia. Xi'an, good morning, how are you? Hey Pat, hello everyone. Hope we're all doing well in the COVID-19 lockdown. Yeah, it's uh, it's unbelievable, and uh, thank you for your time. Um, we've been communicating, and um, you know, you had message that uh, due to circumstances, obviously, that um, yeah, your employment was also disrupted from this. Mine has been um, unemployed as well, so we're all facing some tough times, aren't we? Yeah, I think the whole whole world's in the same boat. But you know, um, mm. every as they say, every. Uh, challenge as an opportunity and I think what it's what it's letting me do anyway is do a number of things that I've just had on hold for quite a while so now I have time to do them and you know online online membership websites and uh yeah. publishing my book and a couple of other books that I've got ready to go and so things like that which had been um chugging away probably a little slower than they should have been I think uh, now I've got no excuse. I'm going to have to get right into it. Well, that's the cool bit. And that's why, um, you know, we wanted to uh, catch you and have a chat, which we appreciate. And it was in gesture of, yeah, I guess, you know, the times of what people are doing now with training and, and dojos being closed around the world. And, you know, we all uh, can, you know, start to see, I guess, how healthy we are and how important training is to our lives and how important having, you know, kyokushin or a martial art of any style um, is to someone's life at this time. And, and, and there's a lot of people that, you know, need it, hey? I think everyone needs it. I mean, uh, what they're seeing is, for example, a spike in domestic violence. Well, that just, just like, blows my mind to think that... Yeah people have been living together and then all of a sudden when they actually have to uh, be in each other's company for more than the, you know, minimal time, they don't know how to handle and people, people don't know how to handle their own solitude for a start. And it shows me too how distracted people are how, and how deliberately we distract ourselves from perhaps what is really important. You know, and uh, when all of a sudden we have no choice, we can't use those distractions, then our reality comes flying home. Sometimes, you know, they like a smack in the mouth, and, and mm. it, it teaches us that we need to do some reassessing about the way we live our life. I think. I think, yeah, in, in that segue, that's where I think people need education, people need other. Um, guidance, you know, and mentorship, all these words that, um, you know, we do get at the dojo from uh, Sensei Xi'an and so forth. And um, now these people that haven't had that type of guidance, you know, what, you know, I guess they're reaching out or something, you know, and that's why these, uh, the, my online program, your online program, other, uh, other people are, are doing their best to continue to keep that connection as best they can. Yeah, and there's a number of areas of life that have to be addressed. I mean, one thing that's very easy to address is just doing some physical movement at home. That's very easy. Anyone can really do that. And if you're too lazy to get up five minutes earlier, well, then get up four minutes earlier. And if, if four minutes is no good, get up three. But the point is you have to make a little bit of an effort to keep physically active because even just the movement of day-to-day -day life, you know, walking from your office desk to the coffee machine and back or walking down to the food mall for lunch or walking to the train set. That alone, people, people are starting to realise how important that little bit of exercise is. And now that they're at home, they're turning into couch potato, potatoes. And like I saw, I think it was uh, Kelly Starrett the other day, was, I didn't even read the whole email. But he said that, you know, the couch is, it's a liar. It promises you comfort and ease, but in actual fact, the opposite happens. And so the physical part is actually quite easy. The, 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 
more important aspects are the mental and the spiritual side. And, and this is where people are starting to realize they lack. And, um, you know, one of the things that I spent a lot of time with over the years, not so much now, but over the years working with different professional sports teams and so on is that the address that I would give them is that the ultimately for professional sport and ultimately for their own personal life, the state of mind they're seeking is what I refer to as inner peace. Because when they have that inner peace, see there's essentially three places your mind can be. It can be in the past full of regrets mm -hmm. and in the future full of fears and apprehensions, or it can be here right now. And when it's here right now, you, you can ease, you can be, do away with, with everything and, and come to a state of inner, inner peace. And for footy players, especially, yeah. where it doesn't matter what code it is, you need to look across at Mandy, Mandy or right, and know that they are present in the game. The last thing you need is someone who has to be part of a play who's distracted, even for a split second. And so I think one of the things that the world is discovering in this COVID-19 thing is how deeply we lack inner peace. I mean, yeah, so you, you know, you, you're fortunate to reference a lot of your experience and time with, you know, various, you know, industries um, with all your, with quintessential training. And, and for those out there, check that out on uh, Avayashian's website. I'm sure he'll push that later on. But, you know, this type of, theory and concepts and philosophies and you know uh, you and I chat on social media and 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 yeah there's all these quotes and it's just bombardment of stuff and I guess you know like you've just re just emphasized it's your inner self you know and I guess people need you know I, I find that through or I found it through Jukshin training I was a professional athlete as a young teenager and kid and and then fortunate to find Xi'an Bill and, and, and the dojo. And then I'm, I'm sharing, I guess, what I found and how I found it through uh, Sosai and a picture of him and that aura. And then I found it that way. How did you, how did, how, would, how did you sharing that with others, I guess? Because there, there's so many different people that have, uh, I guess, some, some, avenue, some avenue of going, oh, well, maybe it is this and maybe it is that. There's a lot of us, I think, I feel, um, are trying to find something. Everyone's trying to find something. Everyone's trying yeah. to find what I think is their natural native state, which is in a peace that our natural, the natural condition is equilibrated, centered love. Okay. When I sit down and talk to a room, put 510 kilogram, uh, New Zealand Kiwis rugby players, yeah. rugby league players, and I say, well, what we need to realise is our natural state is centred, equilibrated love, and let's meditate. And they, they kind of giggle. But 15 minutes later, they're going, it's <laughs> somehow making, making sense, you know? You've touched it. And uh, yeah. this is the thing that... Sorry? You, you, you touched a nerve with them. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. You, Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and we tend to run away from it. There's this really brilliant poem. I can't even remember when it was written called the hound of heaven. Okay. And what it is, is it's, it kind of flips the story. You know, people always are whining and moaning, complaining, bitching, carrying on about how life is so unfair and how all the good things in life seem to, it's not fair, you know, I got cheated or it, it keeps running away from me. But the reality is that centered, equilibrated inner peace, we keep running away from it. It's, it's there. It's just sitting there inside okay. waiting for us to reverse the energy that constantly flows out and shut off the senses just for a second, for 30 seconds or the, a breath, everything starts from a single breath, shut that off and then take the energy back inside. And all of a sudden, with the, in the, literally in the space of a single breath, you can feel that natural native state. And then the trick is to go, okay, well, how important do I wanna make that in my life? Am I willing to actually make an effort 
to manifest that more and more and more. But people aren't willing to do it. We've become so used to distractions and we constantly try to find the, that, that feeling that we get from the inner peace. We try and find it somewhere else in some way else. And, you know, whether it's retail therapy or whether, you know, literally, I think too, one of the big things is that um, uh, physical training, people, one of, the, one of the things which I have never agreed with and I, I tend to disagree with to the, in the extreme is that if you have your health, you have everything. And it's just not true because you meet really, really healthy people all the time who have no sense of inner peace. They have no sense of inner calm. They're completely out of touch with their native state, even though they're super healthy. And what happens is sometimes you'll see young couples will come together based on the fact that they're both really fit and really healthy and they have this love for um, fitness and health. But as time passes, if they don't, also taking the need to address their natural equilibrated state of inner peace and love then they can drift apart you know yeah yeah that's uh deep stuff and uh, i appreciate you sharing a bit of uh that with us because yeah we um yeah we can get bogged down in it or we can uh evolve adapt and move and uh you know a lot of us are trying our best i'm, I'm trying my best to just keep keep it going um you know I, I was starting to get a little bit um you know how people say well business as usual that and uh, bit, well, i'm like i don't think so uh this is uh mm. this is not business as usual there's uh this is going to be very difficult um uh, but we need to continue we still need to keep the positiveness around us and and i guess it was a, a little cheeky segue I'm, I'm pushing here with um a lot of jokshin practitioners are familiar with um, sosai who was in a uh, solitude confinement of approximately, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong with the numbers here, 18 months to three years. And, and, and he was, um, you know, doing his, uh, I guess, confinement in regards to what you're gesturing as such. And, um, you know, you know, what, you know, our leader as such did that. And, and I, I would have loved to have heard what he would have said today to a lot of us going, Hey, uh, You'll be fine, you know. Yeah, well, you know, that it's funny you should say that, you know, business as usual. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the ultimate denial, I think, okay. is, is when people say business as usual. The, the fact of the matter is, it's a really fantastic way to deny some responsibility that you have or deny taking ownership for where you are right now and in in this COVID-19 world uh, it's starting to um, really press home that business as usual is just not an answer and the funny thing is people live that business as usual attitude every day and that's what I mean by when I say people just um, live a life of deliberate distraction mm. and they 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 say business that's what they describe as business as usual. Mm. And, you know, when Masayama went away to his, um, for his mountain isolation, well, you know, he said probably the two biggest confrontations he had were uh, the fear of hunger, not knowing where your next meal is going to come or the next meal after that or the next meal after that. And also the incredible... Uh, sense of loneliness and there's a very different there's a very different thing between solitude and loneliness okay. and Solsai Solsai pointed out that when he isolated himself originally there was a lot of loneliness but ultimately he started to appreciate the solitude and this is what I think people really need to do in this COVID-19 world is that people, they just keep looking out their window going, I want to do this. I've got to go there. I want to, uh, you know, you know and they're constantly seeking that distraction, which they normally have, have because they're just not comfortable with their own solitude. But if pe people, and on the other hand, a lot of people are actually enjoying it simply because they're so comfortable in their own skin. 
with that solitude, you know. So it's a good point. I mean, the business as usual that you, you said, Pat, is it's a real distraction. And I think it's a fantastic way for people to avoid taking ownership and responsibility for things, you know. Yeah, and that, that uh, also, you know, that's a, a couple of um, important words there, taking ownership, you know, and, um, you know, there's uh, one of the Navy SEALs I follow, uh, Joko Willenick, who who now is an author and, and, and is, is far more public figure out in this motivational coaching means. He says, discipline equals freedom. What do you think when it comes to a situation like this now where discipline equals freedom? Well, as also I said, if you're given a choice between a hard path and an easy path, always take the hard path. <laughs> and the fact is, I can give you a couple of really, really simple, concrete examples. I mean, I brought my kids up as a single dad. Yep. And people say, gee, that's amazing. I go, no, it's actually really easy if you have a good relationship with your children. And two of the things that I used to... Um, say to my kids, no one leaves a house unless their bed's made and no one goes to bed unless the dishes are done. And, and I must admit, you know, quite often it was me who do the dishes, but the kids always pitched in and more than once I've got to go, dad, your bed's not made. Yeah, I know, but you're waiting outside. I don't, I don't know. Dad, I'm sorry, <laughs> just make your bed and you can go. So, when, when someone gets into the habit of discipline, and that discipline can take many forms, but the discipline of cleaning, washing your dishes and making sure the sink's empty before you go to bed. Now, the freedom that comes with that discipline is when you wake up in the morning, you have a beautiful clean slate to start in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing worse than waking up and seeing a pile of <laughs> dirty dishes in the kitchen. If any university student has had a share accommodation with people, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, and making your bed. I mean, that discipline of, of making your bed, when you come home after a hard day, the order that a nice, clean, straight bed gives you is a, a form of freedom. It's, it's not just a physical freedom. It's, a, it's an emotional, psychological freedom. And discipline gives you that. When you have that discipline to exercise even a little bit every day when you have the discipline to meditate a little bit every day the freedom that it gives you the freedom from fears of the future mm. the freedom from apprehensions of the future the freedom of regrets of the past all those things just fall away and karate too is a really interesting um place where you can take that discipline equals freedom in karate, people are often preoccupied with the fear of the outcome. They won't fight a tournament because losing the tournament will make them look bad. Right. Or they won't fight the tournament because losing the tournament just, you know, for any reason, it affects them emotionally. But what they will do is they'll pick out little things from their past, which somehow they think that that creates their reality. It creates something that they can rest on now. But the, the, the reality is discipline gives you the freedom to be present now. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen in a tournament or what's going to happen next to worry about even in a even in a uh, uh a kumite just a single round of kumite when you've trained hard the discipline is that it gives you freedom to be present and when you're present you're not relying on some memory of the past mm -hmm. you're not concerned about the outcome you the the discipline of trained well and having trained smart gives you the freedom to be present in everything you're doing. What did you say that guy's name was? Who Jocko, said that? Jocko Willenick. He has a book. I'll, I'll share you the link. Yeah. Navy SEAL. Well, he sounds like a very smart man. <laughs> yeah. He's because put out. That, that's, you know, if you can capture some 
if you can capture something very inspiring in a very few words, you're doing a really good service to people, I think. Yeah, yeah. For those out there, you know, I, I follow, uh, I guess, again, another side of inner peace towards um, my my day to day in sales management is to keep the discipline that I have uh, outside of working, you know, employment and business and transitioning it to, you know, you can't be a sensei or a shihan, you know, in, in regards to your employment, but there's so many traits and things that you have and, and I you know I was just talking to my wife the other day there's certain standards that I have that she has but then other people don't and then we kind of get into a you know well why why are they doing this and how could they do this and and, and what's going on and it's like you know people have different standards and um you know we uh I, I use Jocko and the Navy SEALs for my inner peace as such as what you're referencing to keep me um uh, I guess saying to the point of, oh, great. Here is here is people or here are methods and processes that I can agree with or, or I like to feel uh, are relevant to what I'm doing. Yeah, fair call. I mean, you know, inspiration comes from outside. Motivation comes from inside. And sometimes if we lack motivation, we seek a bit of inspiration. And so when you find a mentor or a leader or a teacher who can inspire you, and then that inspiration turns into the motivation to make an effort in one area of life or another, well, that's really, that's a fantastic thing. And that's, that's a fair call that we could probably do with uh, mentors and leaders and that sort of thing all the time. And, and that, the, the danger, sorry, the, the danger is that we often, the danger is we often pick the wrong mentors and leaders because <laughs> there are people out there. I guess they call them in in religion. They might call them a false prophet. Yeah, right. You know, and mm. a lot of people out there who are completely incomplete in their own life, but they set themselves up to take responsibility for someone else's life as a mentor and coach and the reality is if you just scratch the surface even a little you realize that um, what they offer doesn't run very deep and so this is why you have to choose your leaders and your friends and your um, teachers very very well now that 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 also comes with uh, um, you know you've been very fortunate um, we've been friends for a long time but, and, I've, and I know your background but you know you, you're going to have moments where you do have certain good mentors and you have to you know um, and, and then you can and then you will find some that aren't um, but you do have to go and I'm, I'm working now towards the journey and the journey of how um, these situations um, you know, this is this is a journey. We're all on a journey here. This is not uh, just it, you know. And I, I guess I'm, I'm pushing towards how, you know, I was fortunate to be coached by Olympic coaches, and then I found good mentors. And then there were some coaches that uh, did not get along well with slash, you know, they I wasn't a part of their plans. And um, but uh, you know, we we still stay in touch. And I guess it's it's part of the journey. Yeah, well, I mean, the first red flag ever is when a coach has to determine whether you're part of his plan, you know. Mm. A, 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 coach is, a coach is there to make sure that he's part of your plan and to do everything he can for you. So that's the first thing, you know, and a lot of... Uh, it, you're right. It, it's a very confusing thing when a coach decides that, uh, you know, he determines whether you're coachable based on whether you fit his plan or not. That's the stupidest thing in the world. Well, I but I think, go on. That, well, that, uh, that was what led me to karate though, because I wasn't yes. being um, positioned, you know, as a five foot 10 fast point guard, Pat, wait your turn, you, you're not needed as yet. Um, and, and, and when you're on the court, maybe you are, maybe you're not, but continue all the rest of your commitment and discipline and training. 
um, but just hold five. I don't need you yet. And that wasn't against the coach. It was just, you know, it's a team sport as well. But then what allowed me to express everything else was actually karate, martial arts. It, it, it's up to me. If I put in the time, if I put in the effort, if I follow the right instructions um, of, of, my, of Xi'an and, 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 and so forth, well, it's up to me. It's up to me. And, and that was a beautiful thing I got to find uh, you know, in my early 20s. I had, um, I had a student years ago that you know of, Wally Schnaubelt. Yes. And I became very close to his entire family. I mean, the story of the connection is really quite amazing. But ultimately, when Wally was training with me and living in with me, often his sister, he had a sister. He's got a few sisters. But I remember that one of his sisters would come in with her newborn baby so Uncle Wally could see the newborn baby, you see. And uh, she brought in this beautiful newborn child. Well, anyway, that newborn child went on to become, out of high school, became my Uchi Deshi 17 years later. And... He was a very well-trained and gifted and gift, you know, like the old saying is um, hard work beats talent every time when talent refuses to work hard. Well, this, this young lad, Tyrone Tongia, wasn't just talented, he worked hard too. And at, in high school, he was um, a member of the Queensland High School Rugby League, Rugby Union and touch teams. He was probably captain of two of those. And in his rugby league team, you had players like uh, Cam Smith and Jonathan Thurston and so on. In fact, I believe he put Jonathan Thurston out of the Queensland schoolboys. So he was incredibly talented. But when he left high school, he gave it all away to become an Uchi Deshi. And then ultimately he went from there I remember I'm working on a big bag on the big mitt one day and he's hitting it harder than anyone I'd ever felt. So I, I gave him a copy of the book, um, I, The Greatest by Muhammad Ali. And I gave him a video once we were kings and I had to go away with work. I said, you, over the next week, you have a look at these. And I got back a week later and he went, oh, us, sensei, I read the book, I watched the video. And I start training at Mr. Fenix gym next Tuesday. And he'd, he'd like, he'd full on went into it. And he, he only just missed out on the Olympics by a point. You know, you, oh. he had to, he, he had to fight in the, um, I think the Oceania finals or something. And if he won that, he would have gone to the Olympics, but then he went professional and towards the end of his career, we reconnected and I trained him for the last four years or so of his fight career. I remember. And uh, he retired yep. undefeated as the Australian light middleweight professional champion. Now he said that the major reason he gave away football and took boxing and karate was because he wanted to take ownership of his own outcome. And he said often in a team environment, he, he, the outcome of the match was out of his hand if the teammates didn't take full responsibility. And so he wanted to get out of that. Some people like team sports because they like to have that support of someone in case they're, they're not quite feeling their best or whatever. So by having a team or you work as a team, but he was the opposite. He'd grown up as a member of team sports and he wanted to be able to, be held responsible, not only take um, ownership, but be held responsible and accountable for his own efforts. So that's where he realised an individual sport, there's no escape. No, 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 that's a good story. Yeah, he, he was an exceptional uh, boxer. I followed him after seeing how you were working and training him and yeah, what a, what a, what an athlete he was. Yeah, that was great. Thank you for sharing that because it, again, it, it I guess complements a little bit of the journey that I was on as well. But um, and and for those listening, you know, it's the journey. It's a journey, and um, you know, you got to keep that. Um, you know, th this part now, Shan, I, I like, and I, I I took a little bit of, of this off you many many years ago when you did um, help uh, for a camp for the uh, New Zealand rugby team, and you're working closely with. Benji Marshall and, and, and those guys and I was per, uh, good friends or good as in I, I knew Benji Marshall through Under Armour when I was uh, one of the sales managers there 
and and I walked up to Benji and I and I went oh you know really strong and he looked at me you know gave me the what the hell? hey how do you know and I said come here and I you know, we had a chat about you and the, 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 what I'm huh. uh, yeah, yeah what I'm what I'm alluding to is how you have um, you know uh, used us uh, across your platforms across your contacts across your um, get, guest speaking and and helping you know all verticals from executives to sport teams to you know your quintessential training formats and so forth and and I I, I now have put that you know us uh, towards you know I, I'm very fortunate I've got um, athlete mates that are in the NBA and I've got friends that are you know professional football players and you know I, I enjoy and I, I appreciate them and they may say it jokingly to me but uh, they still you know say us to me and I and I share with them and I have shared with them you know that there are so many different avenues of explaining us but um, how, can you share with us a little bit of that that side of when us came to uh, you know that level how you were pushing it to, or not pushing it, it's probably not the right word, educating others around it? Well, it's it's not hard because it's just a very simple word that describes a very profound state of mind. And that state of mind is simply just don't give up. That's just right. take one more step, one more step, one more step. That's all it takes, you know, like the old that was saying the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Well, you know, quite often with the footy players, for example, um, like I was saying before, if, if someone like Benji Marshall, who is the general on the battlefield of the football game, he has to have faith in his soldiers. And so he looks left, he looks right. Mm. And he needs... 100% trust. So he has to know that the person to his left or right, one, is taking ownership and two, is not just not going to give up. And that manifests in training. You might be doing, they might be doing 40 meter repetition sprints. And somewhere along the line, when the brain starts, the little voice in the brain says, oh, I think I've had enough the the uh, habit is to pull up 50 centimetres or a metre or a metre and a half before the line. Whereas others who never give up pull up 50 centimetres or a metre the other side of the line. Mm. Now, someone like Benji, no one, I always say to the players, no one's watching, but everyone sees. <laughs> and in training particularly you know what it's like you know instantly when someone's not not making the effort okay. they people can be really good at making it look like they're making the effort mm. you see that you see that all the time in your own kids classes <laughs> some of the kids are masters at making it look like they're trying really hard but they don't realize how funny mm. it is you know but when you're talking about professional athletes there's mm. no excuse for that and so that, um, that whole notion of having the courage to take the extra metre, 50 centimetres or metre and a half, no one's watching but everyone sees. And when you've got someone like Benji, who was the captain of the Kiwis, mm. he doesn't, he, he definitely, not only does he see, he also watches because that's his role. And he knows intimately the uh, he you could run down a list of all the players he's ever worked with at any length and he could tell you straight away the level of commitment the level of ownership how accountable they were for their training did they make excuses you know this sort of thing and that is a really simple manifestation of us the the courage to keep going under pressure and not only that the courage to keep going under pressure without it manifesting in your behavior. You know, you, it, you, some people will keep going under pressure and they'll let you know, just so you know, I'm going, I'm keeping going under pressure, mm. you know, and other people won't keep going under pressure, but they'll go, well, you know, I'm really keeping going under pressure. Other people will just get on with it and they'll just, 
do it anyway. And that's really where the manifestation of us is. Because in Japan, you see it even more clearly, you know, and you see it in dojos all the time. When do people use the word us? Well, they use it when they're under pressure. They use it when they're happy. They use it when they're sad. They use it in a whole range of things. So it kind of covers the whole gamut of emotional um, of currency, the emotional um, energy that they have at any time. Yeah, yeah, the, the the right meaning or definition at the right time to to express it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's you know, oh, that's it's cool. like Italians and the word ciao. Mm. You know, sometimes it means hello, sometimes it means goodbye. You know, it, it's it just depends on the circumstances, I guess. Yeah, very good. Um, Xian, the um, you you you've been to Japan, and I, I'm going to see if you know it off the top of your head. How many times have you been to Japan? To see yeah no i'm sorry i don't know i'm gonna um, say over a, about 50 50 plus maybe more here he goes <laughs> uh, i'd say more like probably more like 250 all right no, that's not that that that's if i include yeah i mean i remember once check this out i was riding a motorbike Yep. My buddy had a Harley Davidson soft tail mm -hmm. in Melbourne and he, and he was going to have it shipped back to Queensland. And I said, well, I'll go and pick it up if you like. And he said, yeah, sure. So I r went down to Melbourne and just had the, a party below this 1350 CC um, cruiser. And I rode it from Melbourne home to Queensland, but I rode via Sydney cause I had to, I was, um, it was a, a personal family matter that I get, had to get a document in Japan. And I just needed that one piece of paper. And there was no one in Japan who could get it for me because it had to be an immediate family member. So on this motorbike ride, I parked my motorbike at my friend's garage, mm -hmm. jumped on the plane to Japan that night, arrived at 5 a.m. in the morning, had breakfast, went to the government office, picked up the piece of paper and flew back on the plane that night. So I wasn't even in Japan for 24 hours. And so if you include all those little trips, <laughs> yeah, it's been quite a few. But if you want to talk about significant lengths of time, and by significant, I mean any more than a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then not, not so many. I mean, I went for a year, one stage, three months, another, four months, another, seven months, another. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I I appreciate you sharing that. Again, I, I'm I'm alluding to uh, a bit of now in the next 20 minutes, half an hour, I, a bit of past, present, future conversation of Kyokushin. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have heard you talk uh, passionately about um, its past, present, and future. But I've got some certain questions. I hope you don't mind having a chat with me about. And and uh, I, again, you and I have been fortunate. Um, sit one-on-one -on -one at camps and so forth and, and discuss things and analogies and I'm, I'm going to bring that up a little bit later as well but one of the questions is in the past um, when you uh, fought you you fought in which world tournament Xi'an do you mind sharing and, and, and giving us a brief on on that tournament um, I fought in the fourth world tournament and then and um, then were you, were I, you in, sorry the fourth was what year 87. 87, okay. Yep. And um, Matsui won it. I think Andy Hook came second. Uh, but some of the fights, some of the fighters in that tournament were just, I think they represent in many ways what real Kyokushin was. You had guys like Matsui, Masuda, Andy Hook, uh, Michael Thompson, Nick DaCosta, Michelle Vadel, uh, Peter Schmidt from Holland. You had um, uh, just a whole, yeah, real legends. And uh, so for me to have been able to participate in that was just like, uh, it was incredible, you know. And it was a fantastic tournament, you know. Adamir DaCosta was probably one of my favorite fighters of all time. And I think in many respects, he didn't get the recognition that he probably deserved because he, uh, 
moved away from the mainstream of Kogushin probably a little earlier than many people. So, you know, I mean, he was, I'd say, quite deeply responsible for fighters like Francisco Filio, you know, yeah. who became quite a legend in his own right. So, and Adamir da Costa, there was one fight, Adamir da Costa versus Michelle Vadel. So the South American champion versus the uh, European champion. And Michelle Vadel is just, you know, there's a lot of qualities that you need as a fighter. And one of the qualities which I think I, I used to see in um, Kenny Ertin Bogart from South Africa mm -hmm. and Michelle Vadel and a lot of fighters, but especially those guys, was that fight intelligence, their, their ability to uh, put together a very, very sound fight plan. Wally Schnaubelt was good at it. Gary O'Neill was particularly good at it. You know, I can remember sometimes he's fighting someone 25, 30, 35 kilograms heavier than him. And he's having trouble finding his timing. And people are starting to get a little, you know, Gary, only a minute to go, 30 seconds to go, 20 seconds, you know, and Gary looks like he's still um, completely out. And then seven seconds before the end of the fight, bang, he'll knock him out. Mm -hmm. And it, he's just had that fight intelligence. Well, then I think Michelle Vadel and had that. What Adamir da Costa had was this incredible skill set and the, the a certain, I mean, both of them, but particularly Adamir, that attitude of just never give up. And I think uh, that fight between Michelle Vadel and, and Adamir da Costa was in my mind um, one of the greatest Kyogushin fights. You could probably find it on the internet and you may not, I mean, the, the skill level was incredible, but it's a little bit like, you know, UFC fighters, you, you see someone who's an incredible wrestler who doesn't even go to the ground now. Or mm. in the old days when, when it really was a clear delineation between the stand-up fighters and the ground fighters, but then you saw a big difference. But guys get so good at everything that, you know, they may be a world-class wrestler like Daniel Cormier and things mm. like that. And even Randy Couture, who I had the honour of working with quite a lot in the early days of his career. I mean, it, Randy Couture and Dan Henderson was another. Dan Henderson was a silver medalist in wrestling. Mm. And both of them ended up probably winning more fights with punch knockouts than anyone. Well, the yeah. thing that gave them the ability to get their weight forward and get their, you know, really optimise their power was their skill level in the, in the grappling it meant they weren't afraid of being taken down. Mm. Well, when you watch this fight with Adam Ida Costa and Michelle Vadel, you know, maybe you don't see a wide range of skills, even though they're there. But what you do see is this unbelievable fighting spirit and this this incredible uh, courage, which Salsa said is one of the key things that Kyokushin is all about, is developing that courage to face the challenges of life fearlessly and, and you know, without compromise. And so that fourth world tournament, man, I just, I still think it was one of the greatest ever. Mm. And it was a real, it was a real buzz for me to be there every morning, you know? That's great. And, and, and from then you, you raised, uh, you mentioned a couple of your uh, protégés, your, your elite uh, fighters, uh, Gary and Wally. So then the, they, they competed in other world tournaments, which uh, I guess put you in the coaching angle, which is a bit of a, um, passion of mine and, and in transitioning from fighter to coach how did you uh, I guess not adjust because you were running Uchi Deshi programs you, this was your I guess part of your livelihood as well but um, in putting your your fighters into the, the world tournament now the ones that you were you know preparing yourself for now it's them how did how did that transition yeah I think there was an adjustment because I can distinctly remember that when I was running the dojo and still fighting tournaments, hmm. there were certain things which I just didn't share with people for right or for wrong. I'm not saying it's right. It's just the way I approached it was there are certain aspects of my training, like certain footwork patterns or certain hmm. uh, defensive shapes. I call them defensive shapes and certain ideas 
um, which I just didn't necessarily share with people because, you know, I'd have people come to the dojo all the time. There was a good chance that I'd have to fight them in a tournament. Mm -hmm. But the day, the day I decided to retire was the day that all that changed overnight. Yeah. I, I made a conscious call and I started to um, introduce a lot of stuff. And also what I did was, I was talking to someone about this recently, but I, I wanted to find innovation. Mm. If like, you know, like Einstein or someone said, you know, if you're doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, well, that's, you're, you're insane. Right. And I so I had a range of fighters, which, and, and it started to grow and Wally and Gary, of course, were the most successful, but I had a whole range of fighters like Dom Hopkins and Eddie Sorensen and, and uh, Kevin Baker was one that not many people know about, but he, he fought in North America, one came second in the North American and he came second to Gary. Uh, in the North American Championship. And, uh, you know, um, just there were so many great fighters, Mike Witten, Mark Sang, all these guys who... So the dojo was fantastic mm. and everyone fed, fed off each other. So um, I started to then look for innovation yeah. and I'd studied some human movements at university and I was applying a lot of these... Uh, ideas and you know scientific training um, to what we were doing, uh, which wasn't necessarily the way that traditional karate trained. I think certain aspects of traditional karate has since shown itself to have a very solid scientific base. You know, things like Solskjaer's approach to uh, jump training and explosive training, which now the the word plyometrics very easily comfortably applies to it. Uh, but the interesting thing was I, uh, I started to wonder which sports and Olympic sports is always a good example because they get such good funding and get the best coaches and, and all this sort of thing. So which of the Olympic sports were really, really innovative. Now the next step was, I'm not going to find necessarily good technical skill training by watching a basketball team train. There are certain principles of movement which are universal, but I'm, you know, there's no point in me watching how a pass to a point guard or a point guard blocking someone and then the ball goes over and it's a three pointer. I'm not going to rewind that and go, how did they do that? It's not, applicable to me but certain things are applicable and one of the things that i thought was really applicable was uh to optimize fitness training so the next step was which olympic sport was the simplest of all which required a reasonable level of uh fitness training that was applicable to karate mm -hmm. and it comes down to basically it comes down to running and swimming swimming you just put one arm in front of the other and keep going mm -hmm. and i did a talk to the australian olympic swim team before the 2000 olympics um and at that after that talk i met a fellow named gennady Turetsky, who was the coach of michael klim and, and alex popoff Mm -hmm. And he was really intrigued by my talk because of the way I was referring to the psychology of training. And what I pointed out was the 15 minute barrier for the 1500 four minute mile barrier that no one could do it. Then as soon as that barrier was beaten, everyone's doing it. And it was just a psychological thing. And what would happen if what we know as a minute or 60 seconds, what if that minute was actually the equivalent of 54 seconds? Mm -hmm. Well, then the barrier becomes 16 minutes or 15 minutes and 48 or whatever. So does the psychology of it change? You know, so I was always fascinated in how uh, the psychology of, of 
um, training affected players. And I looked at swimming more so than athletics, simply because, um, well, maybe it was simply because uh, access to um, innovative training systems seemed to be easier for me anyway in the sport of swimming than it was for athletics. Um, and I actually started to subscribe to a magazine called Swimming Technique. And I thought that was so funny that here I was trying to mm. um, innovate training in karate. And I'm, I'm actually subscribing to Swimming Technique magazine because I found, one, the, the sport of swimming shared. They shared a lot uh, of information. And two, the sport of swimming was a very simplistic one. Mm. You know, you, you, just, you just swim over and over. And even Gennady Turetsky said that in time, the only way records are going to be broken is if athletes get taller and taller mm -hmm. because that way the length of their stroke increases or the shape of their body is going to change. And I thought that was really funny. He said if they have really short legs and really long arms. And funnily enough, that American swimmer, Michael, Clean. what was his name? The one that won all uh, the... Phelps. No, not... Yeah, Michael Phelps. You look at his body, he hangs his arms down. His arms almost come to his knees. Mm. So relatively, he had the perfect body in, in, in a way that Gennady Turetsky was describing. So I started to innovate and I came up, one of the things that I came up with was I used to see that everyone would go, last 30 seconds, go, last 30 <laughs> seconds, go. But I realized very quickly that the human condition has a lot of trouble maintaining maximal output for 30 seconds. So we changed that. I changed that to 20 seconds. So you, you look back way back at the tournaments and go, on, and I'd be saying to the guys last 20. And so they got their opposition would be going last 30. And so they'd spend an extra 10 seconds okay. going full blast. And in the last 10 seconds of the fight, they'd start to run out of juice, but my guys were still, being able to maintain that optimal output because pretty well the human condition will let you uh, output optimally for a good 20 seconds, you know? Very good. So, we, yeah, we started to apply, I started to apply things like um, giving athletes, athletes medium chain triglycerides, which is just a, a mm. type of fat oil, you know, and we time it so you give them the MCTs exactly. 15 minutes before they'd walk onto the mat because if you gave it to them um, 20 minutes before or 30 minutes before the, they'd start it start to convert very quickly into fat reserves so it wasn't what you needed but if you didn't give it to them early enough so we were experimenting with all these and some experiments worked some didn't mm. um, but we in the long run we got some pretty solid results you know very good Jim. very good the, the 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 present now, Shan, the present and we'll and we'll get to the future. We've got about ten more minutes, so I appreciate your time. Um the present in just uh I'll I'll share this this one that, that I'd like you to share with others. We had a chat um about uh, you know and the the four Sorry, I, think, I missed all that. Oh, that's okay. I, I missed all that the image froze for a sec. That's you okay. Said ten minutes. I said, I said, well, we'll get to the present and we'll talk about uh, the present and future over the next 10 minutes or so. So not to cut you off, I'm sure we could go forever, but um, just in appreciation of your time. So on a present level in regards to... I, I, could, I could go forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could go okay. forever. I'm, I'm, really good. I'm really good at giving long answers to <laughs> questions that no one asks. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we had a chat um, and, and we've spoken about this because my, my uh, I guess I have a big passion for mixed martial arts and again, more so because of the, uh, the substance of what we do as strikers. But then you have also had a history of being one of the first ever MMA uh, referees here in Australia. But there is a concept that, you've, that you and I have spoken about, which I like the, your definition of, um, which is um, each... Uh, Apologies if I'm not putting it right. But Each range right. trumps the range before it. And yeah, that 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 is a, a nice and beautiful way of putting together 
uh, and I've structured a bit of our training around, my, my dojo training around that concept because of what's out there now. Um, out there meaning, you know, Shian Cameron, brown belt for the last X amount of years in jiu-jitsu. Some people might not even know, he might not even use one gita mawashi against you. Um, you know, certain strikers, are, uh, you know, your Cormier concept and Dan Henderson, you know, and the UFC and MMA at the minute, the striking uh, of of the wrestlers, and it's like, or or he's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and then the whole three rounds, strike, 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 knee, strike, strike, kickbox. It's like, what the hell are you doing? Get, use your use your craft as such. But uh, mm. the next five or so minutes, in the present of what you're seeing, in how we also as Kilkshin, but also the uh, adaption and evolution of that concept that you have, if you can share with everyone, because I, I love it. I think it's great. Well, we work our, all our training around what I call the five ranges. Kick range, punch range, headbutt elbow range. And I call it headbutt elbow range. Some people call it the trapping range. But I call it headbutt elbow because mm. the, the human body is so interesting in that if I can headbutt you, I can elbow you. But if I can't headbutt you by a centimetre, I can't elbow you by a centimetre. So they're exactly the same range. And then the stand-up grapple range and then the ground range. So we go kick, punch, uh, headbutt, elbow, stand up, grapple, ground. And each range trumps the range before it. And that's just a, a term I came up with to describe what is probably commonly known in that mm -hmm. if you're fighting a really good kicker, you don't want to hang around in the kick range. You get inside the punch range. And if a boxer gets whacked by a good puncher, the first thing he does is, does is go in and clinch mm. at the stand-up range. And then uh, the old, um, the old uh, trick of if you want to reduce a powerful puncher to the point where he can no longer generate power, you just put him on his back. And he can't generate power anymore because he has no grounding, he has no feet. And... The importance of feet, I, you know, I really tend to believe over the years, I've, I've come to believe that probably 40 to 45% of all punching power comes from your legs. And you know that to be so because if you jump in a swimming pool and throw, try and throw a punch, the punch goes nowhere and your body goes backwards. So you need to be grounded. So if that's the case, what do you do against a good, strong kicker and puncher is you just take their ground away and then you put them on they're back. Now, the interesting thing is Kyrgyzstan over the years became what it is through its full contact tournaments. It was quite innovative back in the 60s to go full contact. But the interesting thing was over the years in my research, and I've written a new book too, which I'll be publishing later this year. And it's all about my training concepts. And one of the things that I realized was that, you know, I, I've, Pete the Bean from down in Torquay brought out Carlos Gracie Jr. to Australia back in 94, I believe. And I helped him by running the Queensland leg of mm -hmm. the seminar. And Pete and a guy named Roberto Correa, he's known as Gordo, and another guy named Marcio Feitosa was a 19-year-old kid who went on to win eight world titles. And uh, Carlos Gracie Jr. all came and stayed at my house at the Gold Coast there. And just interacting with them on a day-to-day -day basis and training with them and rolling with them um, made me realize that uh, this aspect is vitally important. And I, I was able to do a lot of training over the years with the Machado brothers, particularly Carlos Gracie, who is the old, uh, Carlos Machado, who is the older. And the Machado brothers are Gracie. Their mother was a Gracie. So yeah. they're the cousins. Yeah. And Carlos Gracie, moved to Texas, but before he was moved to Texas, uh, he was teaching in California. And I did a bit of training with him over the years. I remember once we were talking uh, about the different martial arts and he said, look, a good stand-up fighter can knock you out. And he said, you as a karate guy, if you kick me or if you punch me and it, you, you time it right, of course, you'll, you'll knock me out. He said, but here's the thing, as a stand-up fighter, you have one opportunity, just one opportunity to knock me out. He said, if you get me, great, all power to you, congratulations. 
But if you miss, it's 100% guaranteed that you'll lose the fight. Mm. Not 99.9%, 100% guaranteed you'll lose the fight. And they weren't very good odds because I get one chance, but if I miss it, well, how many times have you thrown a punch or a kick and missed? Mm. Okay. So I thought, well, I needed to think about this and, and I really <laughs> looked into it a lot of ways. And the, the really what I found interesting, first of all, in Solsai's book, This Is Karate, chapter 15 is, I mean, the, the guy who translated Solsai's stuff, Richard Gage, he had no, uh, nothing to compare with. So he had to come up with a lot of original terms. Okay. Okay. And so what newaza, the word groundwork, newaza in Japanese, literally means sleeping or lying down. Mm -hmm. You know, when you want to lie down and have a rest, you say, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to have a rest. You lie mm -hmm. down. So he titled that uh, chapter 15, which in Japanese was newaza. He called it lying down techniques. Mm. Today we call it groundwork okay. because the language is innovated. Now, Solsai's chapter 15 of This Is Karate is all about groundwork. And mm. in that he says, look, at the end of the day, um, if you strike well and punch well, you're fine. But if a good wrestler or a good judo player takes you to the ground and you do not know what you what to do, you're in big, big trouble. And that's why Solsai said, if you want to call yourself a martial artist, you have a responsibility to know the fundamental keys to the major, the, the martial, other martial arts. Gotcha. Because it's really important that we don't turn the blind eye to what other people can do. And so it's quite legend is I found too, that when I first started training, even after six months of training BJJ, I would look at most Kyokushin guys in the world and be almost a hundred percent confident that if it got into a bit of a tussle with the, extension of what I'd learned, being able to take it from the kick to the punch to the stand up to the groundwork. With that extra um, experience, I was pretty confident that at least I'd give them a run for my money, if not um, be mm -hmm. able to deal with whatever they had. The other thing that I found really interesting was and anybody can do this. I just think that I'm the only one stupid enough to spend all the time to do it. But I took what is karate, this is karate and advanced karate. And I got a big sheet of paper and I counted the number of techniques in the books. And out of all the techniques demonstrated in those books, about 85% of them were grappling techniques. You, you go through those books and mm. there's not a lot of he kicks, I block, I punch him back. There's a lot of he kicks, I take him to the ground and I finish him. Okay. And not this is soul size three major books. 85% of the techniques are actually grappling techniques where you actually grab, hold, arm bars, take them to the ground, sweep them, finish them on the ground. And that to me was quite a, an eye opening. Thing in that when Kyokushin um, went to full contact tournaments, the content and nature of the training mm. changed quite dramatically. You and this is why some karate, you just some one, karate stars. Sorry, Shian, you just at, one time. Um, so, and I wanted to, because you're on a roll with it, and I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but he's what she, uh, Sosai is one of his best friends was in judo for everyone out there. Oh, Solso's probably best friend of all was Kimura Masahiko. Oh, thank you. That the, the, the arm bar in Japanese are called udegarami, which literally means an arm entanglement, udegarami. Mm -hmm. But in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu world, it's called a kimura mm -hmm. because this was the technique that Solso's buddy Kimura, and I even put a picture of them together in my book back in 87. And, and that's the technique that Kimura himself was most innovatively famous for in that, you know, and when he fought um, Elio Gracie, he broke his arm with that technique. Yeah. So that the Brazilians called it the Kimura. So, and he, a really interesting point that you mentioned Kimura. Yeah. Uh, and one of, 
I, I do have a lot of regrets, probably too many, but one of them was I didn't make a point of seeking out Kimura Masahiko when he was alive and interviewing him because okay. I should have done it. Hmm. I, I interviewed a lot of really interesting people over the years um, and I would have loved to have interviewed him as well. But anyway, Solsai and Kimura traveled together, yeah. the two of them, doing a lot of demonstrations, martial arts demonstrations around Japan. And one thing that Kimura wrote was, see, Solsai was Korean born. So there was a lot of um, anti-Korean sentiment after the war and so on. Uh, and so Kimura was once asked that, that Korean Japanese little karate guy, you know, they talk about him being an amazing fighter and, and mm. you know, everyone says how he knocks people out with one punch and he, you know, fight. Have you actually even seen him or is it all talk? Mm. And Kimura said, well, I have to admit, I've never actually seen him throw a punch in a real fight. He said, yeah. well, I can tell you mm. on a couple of occasions when we were out enjoying ourselves, having a drink maybe, and because he was Korean, all of a sudden, two or three or five or six Japanese guys would start to get aggressive. Mm -hmm. And he said, you look around and there's Masoyama just about to get in a lot of hot water. <laughs> so he said on two occasions... I had a final swig of my drink and I turned around and put it far. And by the time I turned back, they were all unconscious. <laughs> and he said, so I, I have to admit, I never saw him throw a punch, but I've seen the outcome of him throwing a punch on numerous occasions. <laughs> and he said, and, very good. Very good. Yeah, so yeah. And Kimura encouraged him to go and uh, do some judo. And he directed him to the Sone Dojo, which was a, a dojo in Tokyo that was famous for its groundwork. There's, you know, this is pre-Olympic judo. And when uh, any sport goes to the Olympics, any, any combat sport goes to the Olympics, it'll change in a dramatic way. You've only got to look at the boxing to see the difference between right. the scoring system and the, the head guards and everything that they yeah. use in amateur boxing compared to pro boxing. When you look at, um, uh, um, when judo went to the Olympics, the rules changed dramatically because the thing about the UFC is one of the reasons guys like to punch instead of choke is that when someone gets knocked out cold, the crowd loves it, goes ballistic. But when someone systematically manoeuvres themselves into a position where they're able to bang, put a choke on, mm. well, it's kind of boring. The guy just taps and that's that. But when they go whack and knock someone out. The crowd goes, yeah, we understand that, <laughs> you know, bang, punch, jaw. Yeah, we get yeah, it. Yeah. But for the, I can remember I refereed a tournament in 94. They actually called it UFC. I think it was a bit of a breach of uh, copyright, but it was a tournament in Sydney that was won by Mario Sperry, who was a, a very big name in, in no rules fighting back in the eighties and nineties. And I refereed this tournament and it was standing room only. And it was probably one of the first, if not the fight, I don't know, one of the first um, uh, MMA fight tournaments in Australia. And I can still remember watching these guys on the ground and doing really quite innovative things. You know, a movement of they'll move their elbow or they'll change their hip position and it'll change the whole nature of the fight. And I'm intrigued, I'm watching them, I'm intrigued by the skill level and the crowd's going, boo, stand him up, stand him up, knock him out. The, the crowd mm -hmm. took years to get mm -hmm. it. Education. You know, yeah. Um, and so when, when Masayama was traveling and training with um, Kimura Masahiko, he recommended that Masoyama go and train at the Sony Dojo. And that was a very famous grappling dojo. And he, he got really good. There's some really great little stories about his time at that dojo. Mm. The other thing too, is if you look back, this is really interesting. If you look back in the early days before Masoyama was, had even created Kyokushin, he was, a, he was a, a, an instructor at the Yamaguchi Gogen Goju Dojo. Mm -hmm. And he 
he instructed there, but also one of the uh, log books, which is a photo out of the original log book that I've seen, it had Kimura Masahiko mm. as an assistant instructor at that dojo. Now, he, at, he ended up not losing a fight for 12 years. Mm. He was undefeated for 12 years. A couple of those years were affected because of the World War and so on. But he, before he won his first All Japan, he was looking for answers. He just didn't quite, he couldn't quite crack it. And then Sosai introduced him to Sone Chu, his goju teacher. And Sone Chu looked at his hands and commented on how weak his hands look. Now, that's like saying to a Kokushin guy, gee, your shins are soft and your thigh kicks are slack. You know, mm. it's like waving a red bull, a mm. red flag at a bull, because judo guys, and for good reason, mm. are very proud of the strength of their grip. But Sone Chu pointed out to Kimura that his grip was quite weak. Not good enough. So, yeah. So he taught him how to use the Makiwara. And it's interesting because I've just started a new YouTube channel. And one of the first things I wanted to do was to show people a simple way, show people complex ways to do things and they'll never follow it. But uh, I've always liked to try and break things down into simplicity. So I did a video on Makiwara training. Now, Kimura went off. And, and Sone Chu, and I, no doubt Solsai worked with him as well, but Solsai was not, he, he didn't say anything about it. Mm. But Sone Chu taught uh, Kimura Masahiko how to use the Makiwara, oh, yeah. and he worked on the Makiwara. Mm. And then, and he never lost a fight again. And it's really funny that when he won his first uh, All Japan Championship, you know, you win a tournament, you go out and celebrate, hey, you know. Kimura Masahiko, and as Dan Gable is the same, but Kimura Masahiko, uh, when he won the All Japan, he celebrated by doing 500 squats <laughs> and hitting the Makiwara 500 times. You know, that was his form of celebration, allow yeah. himself to do a little bit more hard training. It's, Very it's, good. It's like Dan Gable, Dan Gable when he won the gold medal. You know, you ever heard of Dan Gable? Yeah, yeah. Champion wrestler. Good. One of the best ever. That's it. Well, yeah, indeed. And he was, um, he was my, one of my wrestling coaches, uh, Rico Ciparelli, who was introduced uh -huh. to me by John Donahue from mm -hmm. Melbourne. Mm -hmm. When John lived in America for 10 years training, he introduced me to two, a lot of people, but the two key ones were Gene LaBelle yeah. and Dan Gable. Oh, no. I mean, and uh, Rico Ciparelli. And Rico Ciparelli was what they called Dan Gable's golden boy. He was mm -hmm. one of the great collegiate wrestlers. Now, Dan Gable won the Olympics in 72 mm -hmm. and uh, he won it the entire tournament without losing a single point. And that's like, I don't know, that's like a hundred point basketball game or it's like, yeah. um, you know, a hundred to zero rugby league game, or it's like, uh, it's like a baseball pitcher getting, you know, a no hit, perfect game yeah. five times in a row or whatever. You just, just in an Olympic sport where if someone grabs your ankle and trips you, you lose where you lose points to go the entire Olympic tournament without losing a single point is just like um, mm. a feat. Unbelievable. And more so to the point because before the Olympics, Dan Gable went to Russia, the Soviet union, and he competed there and he shocked the, the Soviets so much that they, it turned out later on that they actually labeled their preparation for the 72 Olympics, that they named it get Dan Gable. And they, mm. it was all about doing, doesn't matter what it took. They had to beat Dan Gable and You're still right. he didn't lose a single point. And he celebrated the next, the next morning he's up early, like before dawn, Mm. heading out for a run and someone saw him. I think they might've been coming back from a night of celebration. Mm. And he said, Where, what are you doing? And you're celebrating. He says, yeah, this is how I'm celebrating. I'm getting ready for next year's, for my next event. You know? Unreal. So, next level, next level. Yeah. She an amazing story. So, Thank you so much for sharing them. They're great. Yeah. 
by all means. Anytime. I've got thousands of them. <laughs> I think, um, you know, everyone's got thousands of stories. It, when you hit your 60s, you've got plenty of stories. Very good. <laughs> Shian, the it's, future... it's funny, you know. I, I, yeah, go on, go on. I'll, oh, I'll get back say, to another I time. Say, no, the, 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 yeah, well, I'm sure, I, I, hopefully we can get you back another time. But the, the future, I guess, uh, now for, from, from this end, and I... I gestured, you know, and you've just gestured. So you've got you've got your you've got a couple of books coming out. If you don't mind sharing that, you've got your online program by YouTube. So for for everyone out there, be aware of um, Sean Cameron's channel on YouTube. He'll be showing a couple of tricks and a couple of uh, nice content there. But um, I guess to summarise, uh, and 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 firstly, mostly thank you for your time once again with this. But um, the future here for what you're doing, how you're doing it, and what you want others just to be aware and cautious of before we, uh, we, we, we summarize it from here. Yeah, well, um, I'm republishing my book. I wrote that book, uh, a book called The Budo Karate Masayama. I wrote that in 87. So that's mm. 33 years old. Uh, and uh, we've been getting it ready for quite a while. I mean, I wanted to publish it last year, but we ran into a problem. And anyone in the industry, in the printing industry, I'm not in printing, but there's a, a thing called the Moray effect. And the Moray effect is when you try to reprint a photo, a photo that has been screened. When you put a photo in a newspaper or book, they put a screen over it and it's got a bunch of little holes. So what that does is it turns it from a, a large image to a lot of dots. And that's the only way they can print it really successfully. So if you look at any photo in a newspaper or a book, under a magnifying glass and you'll see that all is a series of gotcha. dots. Now, when you try to reproduce that, it presents all kinds of problems. So we've, we've just like all the photos in the mm. book, unfortunately I didn't, I, I didn't get copies of them. If I did, we could deal with it easily, but uh, all the photos now is just a, the most incredibly difficult, challenging thing to, to be able to reproduce them. So okay. I've got a, short print run coming up very soon where we're getting right. um, just a couple of dozen books printed to see what we can do. And if it's looking good, we'll get that out. And then very soon after that, or even before that, I've got another little uh, book that I'm bringing out. And then another major book, which is, is turned into such a big um, text that I'm thinking of actually dividing it into three books. Okay. Uh, but that'll, that's, the plan is to bring that out towards the end of the year. Right now, I'm, you know, I've got an Instagram site that I'm, apparently I've had Instagram for quite a while. I just didn't know because my, my daughter set it up for me and she's now helping, helping me with this. I have no idea how Instagram works. I, she, she did, she did information technology. So she's a whiz yeah. at that. I, I uh, I've got my, you, you wrote sorry. back to it. I laugh because you just the other day, I'm, I'm on, uh, I grabbed my phone and it said, she yeah, Cameron Quinn. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, like on Instagram. And you wrote, oh, sorry, Sensei Pat, uh, I'm just getting to this message now. And I wrote it to you about three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you did. You, wrote, you asked me a message. You asked me something. I sent a message like 2017. <laughs> and I just saw it the other day for the first time. But I'll be on to that a little better now. I've got my YouTube channel, which I'm, I've got. We just did uh, four hours of video Unreal. Um, shooting, professional shooting yesterday. Uh, now we're just editing that. The plan, you know, now that um, this uh, virus shutdown has made it very difficult for people, mm. uh, particularly people your age with young families, you know, if you're not in a position to be able to protect your income, it, it's, it's, it must be a very difficult thing. And I've, I've, my income is also ground to a halt. So I'm having to do what I, you know, we, I planned the uh, on, online um, membership website and online training. We looked at that when my daughter was in primary school and now she's in final year university. So dang, I've, I, I've yeah. taken a long time <laughs> to get around to it. You got it's like my brown belt and BJJ. Yeah. Uh, um, so I'm getting onto that. I've started a Patreon um, yep. site uh, as well. Uh, and I'm getting nice response to that. I don't, I'm not too concerned about that, but I am making 
creating a lot of really interesting stuff only for the Patreon yeah. family. Of course. Uh, and the I'm going to keep dripping stuff uh, to the YouTube. I've been doing that at a CAD, what I call at a CAD, which is a deck of cards a day. Mm. I think that's really valuable because it's an incredibly simple way to train. When you travel, it's very easy to put a deck of cards in your uh, suitcase yep. and you shuffle, shuffle them up and away you go. And so I'm building up kind of slow. I actually probably started a little hard for people who haven't been training at all. But I've started incredibly easily for people who have a regular training habit. But the, it, as we start to bring in the burpee cards, the, in, the intensity curve starts to get a little steep. So I just, it's just a really simple, simple way for people to uh, introduce active, activity into their sedentary life. And like Carrie Star Kelly, Kelly Starrett said, the, you become a couch potato, the sofa is a liar and it, it promises you ease and comfort, but it yeah. steals all of that, you know. So we have to get off the sofa and do something. Very good. Thank you so much. Amazing. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed that chat. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to call Shiana friend by my Shiana Billy. Um, and and um, hopefully we can touch base in a couple of months' time and see how we're all going and how we're all coping. But such a beautiful chat, Shiana. I appreciate it. Um, to everyone out there, if you would like, uh, Shiana, the floor is yours for the next couple of minutes. If you'd like to pass on and just say anything, uh, go for it. For me? Well, just keep training, you know. And, and one thing I've found now that I'm in my 60s is that it's very easy to look back and live on your memories because, you know, in, in your 20s, it, I remember when I was training for the world tournament, we do countdowns. A countdown was you do 50 push-ups, sit-up squats, then 40 push-ups, sit-up squats, then 30, 20, da, da, da. Well, we used to do... Well, I was doing because I was getting ready for the whole tournament every day in the morning at training. And my girlfriend at the time wouldn't let me go to bed unless I'd done another countdown from 80. And then that included the stage at 25 and 15. I think it worked out to be something like 600 push ups, sit ups, and squats before I went to bed, right? Mm -hmm. And this is after all the training. And I can't even imagine doing that now. So it's very, <laughs> it's, it's very dangerous mm. as you get older to try and continue training at the level of intensity that you had when you were young. I think the most important thing of training is to, first of all, do something. doesn't matter. You get up one minute earlier, walk out the door, take a single breath. That's all you need to do because the next day doing it will be that little bit easier. So the first thing is to develop the habit of regular activity and training. Hmm. The next thing is everything you, sh you do should be done with safety in mind. One of the best strength and conditioning coach, athletic preparation coaches in the world, in my opinion, is Ian King. Ian King, he, I went to boarding school with his brothers. He didn't start boarding school until after I'd left but he came from a family of, um, of brothers and we did some training. Uh, we did some work at uni together. Um, when I, by that, I mean, we we're at uni at the same time mm -hmm. studying together. <laughs> so I've known Ian over the years now, his, his website, King sports international, his training innovations, I think, are the amongst the best, if not the best in the world, a lot of his original concepts and, and, Training. If I was to mention some of them to you now, you go, yeah, I know that's a training principle which we use. Well, he invented all these things. Sure. Now, now he came up with, I, I always believe that um, the, the best training session you could do is the one you walk away injury free from. Now, he said that you train today as hard as you as necessary so that tomorrow's training session can be the best it can be. And that's a very profound thing when you think about it. Yeah. You train too easy or train too hard, tomorrow's training isn't the best it can be. No. So I think training injury free is as you increase the intensity, do it in a way that you're not going to hurt yourself. And when you get older, 
I mean, you pull muscles and hurt joints in ways that you can't imagine. I mean, getting up from the sofa as you get older can be a challenge, you know? So just movement, movement is everything. And so for everybody, that's all I can say is just develop the habit of regular exercise and for what it's worth, regular in a piece, you know, bit of meditation every day. If you develop those habits very early on and maintain those habits through life, when you pop out at the other end of middle age and you hit your 60s and so on, everything is different. And I can only say that because of my own experience. Very good. Xian, bigos. Bigos, thank you so much for your time. Uh, hopefully we can touch base again. You're a legend. Thank you so much. Uh, stay safe in the Gold Coast. Um, so for everyone out there, uh, we appreciate it. And um, yeah, make sure you tap into Shian Cameron Quinn's YouTube channel and these various other online training platforms. Um, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. Big old Shian, thank you so much for Melbourne. All the best. Awesome. Thanks, Pat.